training with the two-man Ray Crowther football sled. The fundamentals of success with San Francisco 49ers offensive line coach Bob McKittrick. All of the following drills can be done without shoulder pads or helmets, but we strongly recommend that athletes below the professional level always hit the sled with their helmets on. Many coaches have given up or forgotten or do not use the basic fundamentals that are learned in using the Crowther sled because they had to go immediately to using the hands and arms and by doing so, they do not develop, develop the fundamentals that I think are tremendously important. The drills that are about to be demonstrated by Coach McKittrick are basic to what he has been teaching the San Francisco 49ers offensive linemen for over 18 years. Usually, a group of 8 to 10 offensive linemen spend about 15 minutes of practice, every practice, blocking the Crother two-man sled. Although the 49ers have new Crother sleds, the two-man sled that we'll be using for our demonstrations has been used by the team in almost every practice since 1979. That translates to 300-pound offensive linemen beating on the Crother sled for 18 years. As we mentioned before, the coach who instructed, cajoled, and encouraged these offensive linemen was Bob McKittrick. I began uh, my college football at Oregon State and in my spring practice, my sophomore year, I was introduced to the Crowther by the new coach at Oregon State at that time, Tommy Prothrow. I played three years under Coach Prothrow, spent three years in the military, and returned and coached for Coach Prothrow at Oregon State, UCLA, the Los Angeles Rams, and the San Diego Chargers for the next 17 years before coming to the 49ers. In each of those 30-some years of coaching, I continued to use the Crowther as the basic fundamental training device in my blocking techniques. Coach McKittrick has enjoyed a great deal of success, not the least of which is five Super Bowl championships. He's either been hitting a Crowther sled or teaching on one for over 35 years. The following demonstrations you are about to see are the words and actions of a coach who knows about winning football. I'm convinced that the Crowther is the best way to develop a fundamental blocking or tackling football player. Step one, our goal when hitting the Crother sled is to get maximum efficiency out of each strike. To accomplish this, we must take the players through a progression of steps. The first step is to strike the Crother pad with the meaty part of the forearm between the wrist and the elbow. The idea is for the player to use a straight upper arm by swinging the arm from the shoulder in the direction they want to drive the opposing player. This is not a torque block and the player shouldn't try to kill it. We don't want the player delivering a cross face to the pad. All that is needed is for the player to strike the pad three or four times with each arm. For stance and balance, we like for the players to stand with their feet parallel, a slight break in the knees, and perhaps a bit of hip flex. This step does not have to be carried on past the second or third day of practice. Step two, to begin the next step in our progression, we want to align the chin of the player slightly over the left-hand side of the Crother pad. In this step, we will be placing the forearm in front of the body while striking the pad with the same meaty part of the arm. If the player should miss while trying to strike the pad, their forearm should come up in front of their face. We like for the players to have a slight flex in the knees and strike the pad with some movement in the hips. This player is demonstrating a lack of hip movement. All players should use their hips, but not excessively at this stage of progression. This player is demonstrating a slight overuse of hip action. We want players to get the feel of striking with the forearm without trying to kill it. This is the form we're looking for. Some hip movement and a good forearm strike. 
The arm is doing the hitting, but power comes from the hips. Step three. The next step in striking with maximum efficiency is to place the players on their knees with their hips resting on the back of their feet. The objective is to strike with the forearm while extending the hips. The emphasis is on the extension of the hips, the exploding of the hips into the block. The forearm strike is not the important part of this exercise. Shooting the hips into the block is. Rip the forehand and shoot the hips. We don't want to hit the pad with our forearm in this manner. Make sure the players are the proper distance from the sled. Perhaps this player is slightly too far away from the sled any further and they wouldn't get the proper feel for the exercise. In the first strike, the player's hips aren't pushed all the way through. Most of our power is generated from the hips, so we don't want to strike the sled without using them. Now, the following strikes demonstrate the proper form. Notice that the hips have extended all the way through. Step four. The next step in our progression is to hit the sled from a stance and not from the knees. The player should strike the sled from a stance while leaving their feet in place. This is the only time in blocking the crother with the shoulder that players are asked not to move their feet. Normally it's a no-no in football not to move the feet, but the main objective of this drill is for players to experience how much power they are capable of generating by striking with the forearm and extending the hips. We're looking for players to explode from a stance while leaving their feet in place. Depending on how big the players are and how much weight is added, the player may strike the sled and push it away, thus falling to the turf. It's perfectly fine for the player's abdomen to sag to the ground after the strike. During this drill, the ankles, knees, and hips should all be fully extended. The player is also striking the pad with the forearm. Don't let the feet flop. This is a drill where the coach might want to stand on the sled to give it more resistance. Frequently in practice, you will see the crother being hit while a coach stands on the base pad of the sled. By and large, the only reason a coach should stand on the sled is to provide more resistance. We found that standing on the sled is the worst place to view a player's technique. We believe the best place for the coach to stand is to the back and inside of the practicing player, basically where the camera is situated for these drills. Normally, we place heavy sandbags weighing around 40 pounds each on the sled for increased weight. What's proper resistance or weight for the sled? That all depends on factors such as how wet the grass is, how tall the grass is, and of course how big your players are. With large players, we sometimes, in addition to the sandbags, add heavy blocking dummies to the sled. Offensive line players in professional football normally weigh in the area of 280 to 330 pounds. Players of that size and strength need additional resistance on the sled. Determining the weight of the sled is more art than science and is something that the coach should feel by watching his players. High school players won't need as much weight added, if any at all, as professional players. When a player executes this drill properly, their entire body is locked out. With this much resistance on the sled, the player remains suspended in the air and his hips are fully extended. There should be no bubble in the hips. You might discuss with your players who have studied physics that if their hips remain up in the air, they have not converted all of their potential energy into kinetic energy. We want players, as this example demonstrates, to explode through the pad using all of their potential power. Step five. The next step in our progression is for the players to move one step while striking the pad. A majority of players will step with their inside foot when striking the sled with their inside forearm. Many also take a small hesitation or hitch step, and this is of no great concern. Remember to think hips. This is essentially what we want. The player has taken a short step which creates a Z in the knee.
Their head is up, their back is straight, and their hips are fully extended. The player can hold this form for a moment and then the body will naturally drop off. We don't want the front shin to be perpendicular to the ground. If that happens, the player will have to ride up and over their shin. Again, a coach can stand on the sled to give it more resistance. This is good form. The player is on the ball of their front foot, their head is up, and they have a Z in the front knee. Step 6. The next and final progression in this series of drills is to block the sled at full speed. This progression is a culmination of all the previous drills. It's time for the player to line up in a stance and explode through the blocking pad. The player will strike with the forearm, explode with the hips, and use both feet. When blocking the Crother two-man sled, the player's head should always remain on the outside of the pad. There is no drill where the head is placed inside of the pad. It's a good idea to have your players start each practice by hitting the sled with their left shoulder. Normally, the left shoulder is the weaker hitting side. That way, whatever else happens in practice, you have at least improved the player's weakest side. When the player strikes the sled, the front of the pan should generally be four to six inches off the ground. Higher than six inches and the player is chesting the sled as opposed to hitting it with the shoulder. Think head up and butt down. We want players to hit eight to ten inches below the top of the pad. When technique appears perfect, you can always emphasize quicker feet in a lower center of gravity. At some point, this drill can become a conditioning exercise as opposed to a learning and blocking drill. Probably three to four seconds is generally long enough to drive the sled. I believe that using the crowder and then assuming you have a group of eight plus or minus a, a couple players in your group, a 15 minute period on the crowder every day or every practice would be ideal as opposed to an hour one day and don't come back to it for a week. Much beyond 15 minutes is becomes probably a little bit of monotony, becomes a physically exhausting drill. It's probably one of the few drills where you can develop skills, develop fundamentals, and at the same time develop conditioning. But conditioning should not be the point of the, the sled. If you get beyond the point where the player is reasonably fresh, he will just develop bad habits because he cannot do things correctly when he's exhausted. Normally, players are given a sound to start or you can incorporate part of your cadence. We like to see a hand and a foot move simultaneously. There shouldn't be a noticeable break in the rhythm of the feet when driving the sled. Rooster blocks or galloping feet are not what we're after. A player shouldn't take two steps, drive the sled, take two steps and drive the sled. The feet should keep moving in one continuous rhythm. You shouldn't see a player have to move their feet in an effort to control the direction of the sled. The feet should be close to shoulder width apart and the toes and heels should be level. It's not of great concern, but we don't like to see extreme toe in or out. Often this is due to the skeletal makeup of the player and can't be corrected. What we're concerned with is the head up, the forearm striking, the movement of the feet, the hips exploding through the pad, and the free arm pumping for balance. This is the fundamental way of developing blocking skills. In professional football, the use of the hands in regards to blocking have increased greatly. What's legal in pros would probably be considered holding in high school. In either case, what we're demonstrating here is the fundamental way that good blocking is accomplished and performed consistently at any level of play. When I was a college player, we all played two ways. We had to play offense and defense, and I was an offensive guard and a defensive lineman. We used the Crowther 
just as I am going to have it demonstrated by my offensive players. And the coach said, the only difference is you will wrap your arms around rather than striking with a forearm when you are a defensive player tackling someone. We are emphasizing low center of gravity, explosion of the hips, striking with the forearm, moving the feet, keeping the head up, the butt lower than the shoulders, the back straight, the knees bent, taking short driving steps. All of these things you do whether you're tackling or blocking. And again, I'm going to be redundant, but I don't know a better way to teach it than using the Crowther sled. Let's take a close look at incorrect blocking techniques. Our first example demonstrates winding up. A lot of players feel they can generate a great deal of power by winding the arm up, and this is generally true. But to perform the wind up, the player has to contort their body by throwing their arm backwards. We try to show players how quick they can strike their opponent by bringing the arm from the ground or resting position on the upper leg. While a player is winding up, a good defender will be striking them in the face with their forearm or hand. Two common faults are to block the sled either too low or too high. First, let's take a look at too low. This demonstrates blocking with the head down. Head down means tail up, and that's not good form. Sometimes the head and shoulders are both down, as this example demonstrates, and that's also incorrect. We want the shoulders slightly higher than the hips. For example, if a cup of water were poured on the player's back, it should run backwards down their backside and not spill over their shoulders. Probably the most common fault is for players to strike the sled without a knee bend and stand up, thus blocking the sled too high. Standing up translates to blocking the sled with the chest or belly as opposed to the shoulder. Players should try to block through the sled pad and into the chassis strut. With proper form, as in this example, the spring should be on a mighty bend. This is an example of another common mistake. The player isn't blocking the sled directly down the chassis strut, perpendicular to it. Players tend to align themselves too far inside of the pad. A good rule of thumb is that the player's outside eye should see the pan bolt that joins the chassis brace to the pan base. On all Crother drills, the player's shoulder should be parallel with the top of the sled pad. And importantly, the player should block the pad perpendicular to the chassis strut. There is a tendency for players to block the sled perpendicular to the center plate or pan base. This is incorrect. Additional drills. Let's take a look at some additional drills that can be used with the Crother sled. Our first drill consists of a player blocking the sled with their right shoulder and then blocking the dummy with their left shoulder. Normally, the coach gives the player the command, break, and the player releases the sled and goes to block the dummy. It's beneficial to remind the players to remain low when coming out of the stance and going to the second level blocker. We want the same fundamentals that are used when striking the sled to be used when blocking the dummy. Try to keep the player holding the dummy to stay near the pan base of the sled so that an unrealistic angle isn't created for the blocker. A variation of this drill is for the player to block the crother and dummy with the same shoulder. Another drill is to align the crother pad on the outside shoulder of the player or front side shoulder of the center. The player must reach to block the defender, or in this case, the crother pad. We're looking for the player to take a short forward and lateral step with the front side foot while not raising the body. Recognizing, of course, that a good defensive player will react and step to the outside as the player tries to reach him. The emphasis should be placed on not raising up. We would like to see this much of the pad visible while the player is in their stance and throughout hitting the sled. 
As the player steps to the outside, their head should remain low but not go beneath the shoulders. Some coaches use a shoot for this drill, but we found it to be ineffective for two reasons. Number one is players weren't generating power underneath it. And number two, it provided no blocking resistance. This example shows the player raised slightly as he stepped to the outside. We would like to see the head remain above the shoulders but not raise the body up. Another drill that we incorporate in our training is to back the player off the sled to linebacker depth. The player approaches the sled just like he was in a stance. Again, the emphasis is on the forearm strike. Keeping the head up, exploding the hips, taking short steps and not breaking the rhythm of the feet. At this step, the player should put the spring on a heavy bend. It's important for the coach to check that as the spring rebounds, there's no separation between the player's shoulder and the crother pad. The player should explode with their hips with enough force to compensate for the spring rebound. In effect, the hips become shock absorbers. As this example demonstrates, we want to emphasize speeding the feet up at the instant of contact, exploding the hips at that instant, and striking with the forearm. I've been asked at times, uh, how do you get a player's feet quicker? And really, there, there's some drills, uh, as in skipping rope and, you know, foot movement drills that are not directly related to football that probably help foot quickness. But much of it is strictly a mental, mental thing. Can I move my foot quicker? Sometimes a player is moving his foot as quickly as he, at least as he thinks he can, but he picks it up uh, four inches off the ground. And you might see that and say, don't pick it up so high. You only have to pick it up enough so you don't trip over a blade of grass. So that in itself can make you make a person quicker. But basically, you can think quickness, just as you probably had the little drill where you hold your hand and somebody drops a dollar bill, and can you grab it before it slips through your hand? Well, you can develop quickness, and the same thing can happen with your feet. It's, a, it's obviously a somewhat mental, and some people are more gifted than others. If they, everybody was at their maximum, some people would be quicker than others. But nearly everybody can be quicker than they were before they started developing their quickness. Another additional drill that we use is trapping the crother sled. Watch as the feet speed up at the moment of contact. Each of these drills requires more confidence from the players. These drills are also good in helping to break up the daily routine by adding a new challenge. One drill that we occasionally use is the one knee block. This drill is designed to help teach players to lower their center of gravity. The most important single thing is to lower the center of gravity where the individual has an advantage over his opponent. I believe the use of the crowder develops that. It also enhances the explosion, the fundamental foot drive with a weight that is not as good as a person to block, but I've never found a place where you could get enough people to stand and be blocked. So the crowder reacts more like a person than any other man-made device that I've run across. The player should approach the sled at less than full speed from linebacker depth, drop, touch the inside knee to the ground, and explode off of that knee, just as if they were coming out of a stance. If you can get your players to drop their hips just before contact, they will have an edge and leverage over their opponent. This wraps up our training with Coach McKittrick. If you have any further questions, please write...